everyone. Welcome back to the Farmer Talk Show. I am your host, Park Ryan, and I'm super excited to be here in the Portal, Georgia, with uh, one of my best friends, Roy Mosley Jr. Y'all give a round of applause for Roy Mosley. And uh, how you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty good, man. How you? Doing good, man. Man, I've been with you for basically a week. And let, yeah. Let me tell you, man, it's been fun. <laughs> me and him have been um doing a Georgia pork tour, and I've been got, been able to see folks like um Laura Jensen, another good friend of mine, as well as uh going down to White Oaks White Pasture Church. with some of your connections. Uh, so hey, just thank you for the hospitality you've given me for this week. Um, not a lot of people are that kind, but I appreciate it. And um, yeah, let's let's get started. So uh, before we officially get started, can I have you uh, lead us with a, a moment of prayer, and then uh, we can kick off the interview? Sound cool? Yeah. All right, let's go. Lord, we like to thank you for con just continuing to bless us and keeping everything going on the farm. And Lord, I like to th just wish you that you would just reach out and try to help all of the farmers and everything that we're going through this year, everything we're going to have to deal with next year with the rising prices. Um, just help it, each and every farmer just figure it out, Lord. I know it's going to be hard. Um, I just continue that you bless all the pork farmers and everybody's able to maintain their markets and do good this year. Um, and just continue to look, look over us and keep your hands on us and our families, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, so. Um... Dude, we we've been friends for what three, four years, something like that. Yeah, and uh, I've been blessed to be a part of your journey within those three years. And dude, let me tell you, man, I I'm so impressed with uh, not just what you're doing, but what God's been able to do in your life. Um, but I remember one time, it, like part of our friendship, you were going through a hard time. Uh, and uh, I want to know if we, we could talk about that, that hard time. Does that sound okay? <laughs> yeah, we can. All right, all right. Um, so, yeah, you were in a really good place farming-wise uh, and yeah. building up your operation, building up your sow herd, uh, building up your brand, and then uh, almost overnight or within a couple of months, it all got taken away from you. Talk, talk about what actually happened and uh, just how that made you feel um, being hurt by people that were really supposed to be there to love you and support you. Uh, yeah, it was one of the most trying times that I ever had. My granddad died. We had our farm. Um, we had got everything going, had a good operation going. And our family, when my granddad died, they just kind of fell into turmoil and started fighting amongst each other and fighting over the land. And it was just a rough time when it was all selling, said and done. We basically had three weeks to move our entire operation. My parents' house, um, my place was too old to move. Um, I had to leave it. It was, I mean, it was bad. If it wasn't for my family on the other side helping us, there's no way we could have moved everything in three weeks. Um, I had 32 sows at the time. I cut them down to like my best eight. Um, sold off some boars. Um, I had a ton of pigs that I was growing out for somebody at the time. Had to kind of basically early terminate that contract and send them at the size they were because I had to get rid of them. And went from uh, landowner and homeowner to basically homeless. Had to move him back with my great aunt. Um, sold all of my trucks, my trailers. Equipment, tractor, had down to one little old tractor that I still have um, and just had to basically start over with nothing. And God just blessed me to be able to fight and come back. I mean, it wasn't easy. I had some days when I just wanted to just give up and get rid of a few pigs that I had left, you know, and start over and do something different. Um, that's when I almost took the job at White Oaks. I was over here one day on this place where my farm's at now. Um, my aunt was a blessing. She's been a blessing in my life since all of that happened. She came to me with the proposition of this place. And it's 11 acres right here at this hog farm. And I've been here ever since. And I turned it from just an open field into what it is now, just through hard work. But I remember when I first started working on it, I came over here and 
I basically right out there in that field, in the middle of that field, had a breakdown. I mean, I was just at wit's end, didn't know what to do, didn't know how I was going to keep going, and I just kind of had a breakdown out there in the field. And, you know, but that was something that needed to happen. Uh, God let me break all the way down, and he kind of told me to get up. I could hear him telling me to get up and, and get back going. And I brushed the sand out of my face and wiped my tears and got up and, I started putting up posts around this place and put in 20 something posts that night um, right before it got dark by myself. And I just took off from there and he's just been opening up doors. I mean, it wound up being the best thing that ever happened. I was having to deal with people with them poisoning my pigs. I, um, some of my best stock got poisoned. Um, they would turn off the water to the sows that had pigs while I was at work. So just a peace of mind and not having to be worried about that and worried about my livestock, you know, I put so much into them and having to worry about, you know, people, other people mistreating them. It's a big relief. That's a blessing in itself. When I think about your story, I think about how you're not alone in that. I also think about how it's extraordinarily hard doing something you love and having that stripped away no. Um, but the interesting part of your story is you talk about how that stripping allowed for you to actually have a better operation in the long run so far. Yeah. Uh, so talk about how those opportunities from living in comfort before you were originally and having to go through adversity uh, and how that adversity has allowed for you to be a better pig farmer, be a better a land steward, uh, and also even being a better uh, family man as well? Well, at one, um, it caused me to be a better person. Um, it's easy for us to get outside of ourselves and, you know, not saying that we think we're above God, but we we get too godly amongst ourselves sometimes. And um, it's good to know that God can humble you at any time. <laughs> he can humble you back back down at any time so like now when anything happens to me or anything great happens I'm I still I remain humble you know and I thank God first and foremost you know anyway I praise him when when I was down and out and I have to you know praise him when I'm up when stuff does happen you know I it's all him I mean I get out here and do the work of five men some days you know and it's all because of him that I'm able to do everything that I'm doing um when that happened, when I first started back over and I got the pigs over here, I was farming this place with a, uh, I had bought a PT Cruiser car. <laughs> Ryan's seen pictures of it. Man, <laughs> let me tell you something. <laughs> that dude was hauling <laughs> pigs and all kinds of things with that PT Cruiser. I'm not talking about the, the trunk. I'm talking about he at, you actually had trailers. Yeah. The back of that thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, um. So that uh that was a humbling experience in its own self. But um, you know, at the same time when I would get stuff done, I, I have people laugh at me you know, when I come through all in bread and different stuff with it. But I mean I still would thank God because at least I had a way to go, you know. I wasn't walking anymore. So that was a step up. And by the time me and you met, um, when I went down uh to that first boucherie, I met one of my buyers that I still have now, and we wind up being really great great friends too. Um, uh, Marvin, and um, that's that's been a great relationship, also. So he's one of my biggest pig buyers. So, you know, I think it's really awesome that Marvin, y'all two meeting at uh John Jackson's uh Georgia Boucherie Festival, and uh when y'all two were talking, you're like kind of like trying to figure each other out a little yeah. bit, <laughs> and uh, you know, fast forward a Say couple of years, each other a little bit, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, but y'all bonded with pigs, yeah, and um, yeah. I remember because I was there, yeah, I remember you like, oh, well, Berkshire over everything, and <laughs> He's Marvin, over everything. <laughs> Marvin like, well, Durock over everything, <laughs> and I was sitting over there in the corner like, man, these guys so cute, they acting so cute right now, look at them, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, a couple of years later, you guys have helped each other out yeah. in, in times where you've needed to, I know Marvin has gone through a lot of trials and tribulations as well. Yeah. Um, you know, even recently, and you've been able to be there for him as well. Yeah. Uh, talk about how, how important it is to have that brotherhood 
even in farming, someone that you can rely on, depend on, and what it means to be a good brother, whether they're blood related or not? Um, it's great. I mean, farmers, we we have this whole thing sometime of, you know, we're doing it all on our own and you know, we have this macho sense of pride, which I mean, that's just part of with the work we do, that's just part of what comes with it. But I mean, you always need somebody and it's good to have, you know, a friend that's in the same thing that you're in and understands, you know, it's hard when you're talking to people that's never farmed or people that's never raised pigs in their life. It's hard for them to understand some of the trials and tribulations you have to go through even just every day on the farm, you know? So it's good to be able to have a good conversation with somebody that really understands when you tell them, Oh, I had to do, such and such today, and they can really understand. Whoa, man, that was you know that was a lot. You had to get do do a lot, you know. So it's nice to have. Um, that's one of the things. Even outside of us doing the tours with the kids and stuff, that I want to start later on. Just even in our pastor, little pastor support community, and try to get like a men's group together. You know, you you need that support. It's it'll be it, sometimes I think it would help for other people or beginning farmers to hear some of the plight or the problems you had to deal with. Along the way, it could really help somebody or save somebody else from having to go through the exact same thing, you know, or to give them that strength to pull through if they're going through the exact same thing. And that was one reason me and Marvin bonded so well. Um, he had been through the exact same thing with his family that I had to go through. And him just, you know, giving me encouraging words and telling me, you know, how he dealt with it and how he got through it, that, that was a great help. Even to be able to turn around and do it for him again later on, you know. Um, and that's that's what it's about. Um, being a being a good friend, being a good brother. You don't have to talk every day on the phone. We don't have to see each other all the time. But when you need me, I'm there. I got your back, and that that means a lot. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Preach it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, since you've moved to this property, uh, your business has changed as well a lot in terms of you know from what you used to do to how you're thinking more as a businessman now. Talk about what that mental shift uh, in your business was like and, you know, how that's helped you make more money in the long run. Um, In the beginning, I was so focused on uh, building that perfect pig that I didn't do a great job marketing. And right, say that one more time. I think, I think some other people need to hear this. <laughs> I was so focused on building the perfect pig before I did any marketing. And um, I would tell somebody starting out, it's both. You got to do both. Because um, I've seen guys that have jumped out and overmarketed themselves, and then they don't have what, what they tell people they have, and then that causes a problem. It causes them to lose contracts also. So, um, I mean, just just do both of them at the same time would be my recommendation. But um, me, myself, I started out just trying to have the perfect pig the first few years, and it kind of hurt me when I finally got that pig and then I didn't have a great market for it that I should have had, you know, for a pig of that caliber, I felt like. And me having to go back to the drawing boards, you know, just trying to get by and then, you know, me having a different mindset when I started over to jump out there and find those markets, you know, start taking my meat, competing in some of these competitions, um, build my own, basically build my own customer base. And so on the retail side, I was able to build a pretty good customer base on the retail side and um, starting to pick up more and more people as when COVID hit, it really kind of jumped things off. And my main business, the feeder pigs, I've never, it's a great problem to have, but now I can't keep up with it, with the demand that I have for my feeder pigs, which is a great thing. Cause I remember when it was the other way around. So, I mean, you know, just changing those things and not being afraid to, when I see something not working, not just being bullheaded and keep doing the same thing, you know, just stopping, stepping back away from it and figuring it out. Amen. So. Amen. And I also love how, you know, me and you have talked a couple of times about you're really enthusiastic about making that extra dollar with the retail cuts. Yeah. Uh, and now you've kind of switched things a little bit. So talk yeah. about, uh, how you you switched the uh, product line for okay. what you have? Well, this year, um, instead of trying to offer so many cuts, the only way people are going to be able to get specialty cuts is if they buy a whole pig or half a pig. So um, in the future, Mosey Farms is just going to offer their 
my sausage line, my breakfast sausage, link sausage, <clears throat> and probably a hot sausage. I'm going to try to just push my sausage brand this year really hard. Um, I can make more doing that than trying to do so many retail cuts and save that for people that actually want to buy a whole pig or half a pig and get it and want it processed. So I think that's brilliant. Um, I know talking with John Jackson, who's a good friend of mine, uh, one, one of my favorite memories of him is when we were talking, he talked about how he was like, Ryan, you know, if people are raising pigs and they don't got a good sausage game, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And I, I, I personally believe that's a hundred percent accurate because if you can't sell the sausage, can't sell the ground pork, um, then how in the world are you going to be able to sell these high value retail cuts? Yeah. And maybe you might sell bacon, but you know, that's yeah. a very small percentage of a whole hog. That's right. That's what we're going to be offering just to push the sausage line. That's my best seller. My bacon is a big seller. So, Bacon and breakfast sausages and link sausages is going to be what we push this year. We try to get away from so many of the cuts, and it's a lot more work. We're getting ready to try to expand our the herd so we can produce more feeder pigs this year. We're hoping to shoot for close to a thousand this year if everything works out. Ooh, so, <laughs> Ooh that's going to be hefty. Yeah, so we try to provide people that have their own markets um, that don't want to do all the breeding. That that can be one of the hardest parts um, to raising pigs is the uh, fairing, um, just maintaining sows. Um, so I'm telling, the, preaching to a lot of farmers to just <clears throat> come and buy high quality feeder pigs. And you know, this pig is you tell me what kind of pig you're looking for in your market, and let me provide that for you. And you just raise the pigs up. So and they can get anywhere from ten pigs to a hundred pigs. So. Yeah, not a lot of people are, uh, I would say, have the temperament for being uh, a fair run operation. Yeah, and a weaning operation. But for you, you've you've got it down pat. You've like, this is my love. This is what you love to do. <laughs> and um, talk about what what it would take for someone who might be considering breeding, because there are a lot of people that I've met, especially homesteaders, who um, start farming and they start farming we're breathing stock first yeah which is like a huge no no yeah um so talk about you know what it takes to be a um farrowing weaning operation for you one of the things is uh you have to figure out the genetics that's going to work for your farm so i see people get caught up in specific breeds and you know they got to breed this breed they got to breed that breed um one thing i always my motto is breed with a purpose um, a lot of people just, I see people mixing hogs and I don't really understand the purpose behind <laughs> why they're crossing this with that, but, um, breed with a purpose and you have to build a sow that works for your operation. So my operation, because I do, um, have a small row crop operation also, and we do heirloom vegetables, um, which we also use all of the vegetable trash to feed pigs, but, um, just, I need for the time, so I, I I don't have the time to have a fancy barn and hate lamps, and I never believed in fairing crates, so I'm not going to lock my sows in a crate. Um, yeah, he ain't got any of that, y'all. No. <laughs> not, not here, not in these parts. <laughs> so um, we just we build a strong, sturdy, sturdy sow that during the summer months, even into the fall, we put them in a – Pat and a paddock, maybe a half acre acre paddock, put out a few round hay bales, and those sows are able to go in there and, and handle their business. They're able to go in that head and they come out with not eight, nine, ten pigs, you know, on the regular. And I don't have to do a whole lot to them, you know, as far as managing that sow. She can go in there and handle her business. If I give her the tools to do it with, she can do it. During the winter time, um, when it get cold like this, we have some A-frame fairing huts that we use, and we put the sows inside those in a pen with those huts for two weeks. Um, so our the pigs stay in for two weeks to get them going, and then we open all of the back doors into another paddock and let all the sows group together with their pigs, and they stay there for another two weeks. And when those pigs get a month old, we actually something unorthodox and some people have thought I was crazy for doing, but we actually at a month old, we turn our sows and pigs back into our breeding herd. 
And we do this for a couple of reasons. We creep feed the pigs on pasture so the pigs are able to come in and get feed. Um, Ryan got a chance to see a set this morning that we actually didn't creep feed just to push them. And we pushed the sows out a little heavy um, between eight and 10 weeks. But to see how they would do without creep feed and just running with their moms um, on pasture. And they look great, y'all. Like, Yeah, not, not having any extra feed to their moms or anything like that. Mom's still on the same diet. Um, so we do that and they stay out with the herd for another month and then we bring them back in between around that eight weeks. We bring them in and wean them off and process them and lock them up. And most of the time by then they're gone or like these today, they, <laughs> it was all in one suit. We weaned them this morning, castrated them and they went directly on the trailer. And some people say, Oh, well you can't do that. They got to heal up. We've never had a problem with that. If your pigs are good and healthy, you don't have to worry about pigs dying or the next day dying when you get them where they're going. Um, all of that is is how healthy, healthy your pigs are when you get them. Um, pigs should be vibrant. I tell people when they go get pigs that, that that pig is acting lazy and not wanting to move around and be a little livery of them. That pig should be up and going and ready to dart and, you know, <laughs> run all over the place. So, um, And you won't have any problems with them as far as getting them acclimated to your place most of the time. But, yeah. As you were talking uh, earlier, you mentioned having the perfect sow. Uh, and so I, I'm curious, like, what is the perfect sow for you? A perfect sow to me, um, we I'll tell you what we started with, what I have in my pigs, but I t and then I'll tell you what's the perfect sow to me. Um, we started with uh, blue butts and Hampshire commercial pigs and I actually started with old line Berkshire boars and got a cross, a 50-50 cross that we actually went back and bred that 50-50 cross back to their dad. Um, and then we turned around, oh, some large blacks too. We did some Berkshire over large black also. Um, then we took those, all of those pigs, bred them back to their dad again. And then we kind of bounced back and forth with their dad and another um, Berkshire that we brought in with a little different body conformation to put some width on them. Um, and we kind of played back and forth with those crosses for a while. And then I came into the old line Duroc that we're putting over the top of them now. And then we just got an old line Hampshire. But um, a great sow to me, I, I used to want the biggest, prettiest sow that you can find. And I quickly realized that was something I realized at the other farm. Um, I actually did my own little field test to see. And for me, um, what it took me to run three of those big, giant, beautiful sows, I could run five small sows, small frame sows. So we started actually breeding our sows early. And some people don't believe in that, but I do. And it actually, we want the sow to get stunted. So at about two, three years old, when she's finished growing, she makes about a three to 400 pound sow, not a six, seven, 800 pound sow. Is what what we're trying to stay away from, um, and it just makes me more profitable. You know that that three to five ratio is an extra four liters a year. You know off of those two sows for the same amount of money, and that's what I look at. So a great sow to me. We don't too much care about how pretty and all of that she is. Um, I want the right body conformation, but a sow that can on her own that I could put her up there and she can come down with eight to 10 pigs unassisted. I don't have to stand there and baby them and watch them. I don't have time to dry them off. You know, that's okay for the people that can do that, but that's something I don't have time doing. Um, perfect example, the sow that we locked up before we left to go on tour. Um, I came back that night and she was, well that morning and she was um, in the midst of having pigs and we come back and she still got the nine pigs. She had what, two days later? Yep. Yeah, yep. and she still got the two, that, and nobody checked on her, bothered her, anything. Um, so that's a great mom to me, and that's what I breed for. Amen, amen. And I think your method's somewhat unorthodox because a lot of people are taught, well, you need to spoil your pigs rotten, essentially. Yeah. Give them the best barn that you can. No. Give them plenty of this, give them plenty of that. And I think what that does is it weakens genetics yes. a lot in the long run. 
to where, and we we joke about this with the commercial hogs, right? A lot of commercial hogs, the moment you put them out on pasture, they ain't going to survive. Uh -oh. And the ones that do uh, get stunted oh, and yeah. a long time to recover. Yeah. But I think even in the pasture pig world, there are a lot of folks that are spoiling, pampering their pigs yeah. to the point where their genetics aren't nearly as strong as it could be if you did intentional stressing. And I think there's a fine line between uh, I'm not going to feed my pigs every single day, uh, whether because I'm putting enough pig food feed out for them and I'm, I might not see them for two days. Yeah. I mean, there's something that you might, they, we actually did that. Oh, oh yeah. Point. We were gone for a couple of days. I mean, and come back and everything's just how I left it. It's fine. I mean, um, great pastures is, uh, is essential. I mean, you have to have good pastures. We try to keep something green on our sows year round. Um, we just, we overseeded our pastures about two months ago, month and a half, two months ago. And so for the rest of this winter, our pigs will be rotated around on triticale, black oats, and um, daikon reddish. And uh, that provides a lot. So on the days when we do do that two days or we don't feed them for two days, the pigs are not hungry. Mm -hmm. They're out grazing. They're fine. When you come back and see them, they're standing out on the pastures. When we come through early this morning, every silent pig was out on the pasture eating. And when they heard my truck, they come to the bottom and we fed them, you know, and I hadn't seen them in two days. Um, so that's another thing. Uh, a lot of people tell pig farmers, oh, if you're going to be a good pig farmer, you got to be there every day. And that's what makes some people shy away from pigs or choose cows because they don't have the time to be there every day. You know, they have other stuff going on and that's fine. But find a sow that can handle that or that can fit that. Um, that's the main thing. And I think a good recommendation uh, with that, because every, there's a lot of nuances when we make a statement. Yeah. Uh, I personally would recommend, like, if you're new into farming, you probably should be there every single day just to get yeah. acclimated. Yeah. Um, Roy's been raising pigs since you were yeah. you were young. <laughs> you know, so it's a little yeah. different when you come from a farming background versus I've never raised any livestock or barely have raised livestock in my life, let alone pigs, you know? And one thing I teach is having that farmer's eye, developing that farmer's eye of observational skills. It's not just giving your pig uh, or any livestock uh, food, water, sorry, not food, feed, water, and shelter, but it's all the context in between that, yeah. uh, you know? And so you can't, you can't just have a farmer's eye <laughs> that comes with a lot of time, a lot of observation, looking at your land every single day, if not multiple times a day. But once you get to Roy's experience, I mean, you've been raising pigs for how many years? Well, I grew up with my granddad raising pigs, so. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And how old are you? <laughs> I'm 36. Yeah, see? So yeah. he got <laughs> decades of experiences raising pigs. Um, you know, so if you're just new and starting out, be with your pigs every single day. And over a couple of years, you know, decades, you get to a point where you know what works for you and what doesn't work. And that allows for you to make kind of those unorthodox or even, I'd say, radical um, farming decisions that might seem very skeptical. Because I remember when you first told me that, I was like, you do what now? You know, <laughs> you haven't seen your pigs in how many days? <laughs> but when you start talking and me having an open mind about it, when you start talking, I realize, oh, he knows what he's doing. And not only does he know what he's doing because it shows in the quality of his pigs. Let me tell y'all something. His pigs have perfect body condition scores. I went out to that field the first day. I was like, I've never seen um, a hog operation where all the pigs were at a three. Not highly obese, like at a five, mm -hmm. or we emaciated don't. because they are um, uh, they got piglets like at a one, score one. But they were at solid threes. And I thought that was super impressive. Even for what you do, being unorthodox, it doesn't matter – what you what you doing? The proof's in the pudding, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, judge wisdom by her children, and your children show in <laughs> in terms of having high quality sows that can uh, survive very well out on pasture, uh, even with like some of the alternate feed stuff that you're using. Talk about you know what kind of feeding program you have 
because it's definitely not straight grain like that's for sure no um so i and I, i'm curious to see people's eyes bulge out of their heads <laughs> um, as you're about to say what you do so your sows are a lot tougher um than people get them credit for um sows don't need all of the high protein and stuff that growers they don't need the same ration that your grower pigs or feeder pigs um need and that's what happened i see happen in a lot of operations they try to feed those same uh high protein high quality feeds to their sows and it costs you a lot of money um a sow is very tough we treat our sows more in the line of um mama cows i mean we build uh cow peas uh to store up for the winter time and the sows are able to go in and rip those bells up and eat the peas and they'll eat a lot of the leafy green that's still um in there uh we use baleage um, is another one, grain sorghum baleage. Um, we actually put round bales of that out and allow, uh, our sows to eat that as well. And that, and it's great. It's really high in protein. We use, uh, distiller's grains when we can get them. Um, we use bakery waste, um, and, uh, vegetable waste. So we use ve everything that comes out of the garden, any crop we grow in our, in our garden is year round. So we go from one crop right into the next. So it's pretty much something all the time in the garden. So everything when we finish with it gets fed back to the pig so we don't have any waste there. Um and a bakery waste is a big is a big thing. I mean, you the pigs are getting so much stuff in that bakery waste. Um you just have to finish figure out how to balance unbalanced rations if that's what you're gonna use. Right. Don't think that you can lock that pig up and feed him only bread or only vegetables please don't. Are only even just grain i've seen people lock their pigs up and feed them just straight corn and think that that's going to make a pig none of that works but a combination of many unbalanced rations creates a balanced ration um we give our sows mineral and premix free choice um so we don't force feed it to them we add a little bit of soybean meal to it and we put it out about once a week during the winter time, we put it out once a week, and it's amazing. During the summertime, I put out a half a bucket, about a half a bucket of this stuff, about every week or every other week. But during the summer, when the grass is out and everything's perfect and going good, it'll slow down. That same half a bucket will last two, three weeks. Wow. Same thing in the wintertime. Um, when I lock them up in the corral, that half a bucket will disappear in a week. You know, but once they get out and they get back in the rotation of grazing again, it'll just slowly settle off. You'll start seeing it last a week, two weeks, three weeks, you know. So the pigs know when they need it. Um, You don't have to force that kind of stuff on them. And all the time putting it in their feed and spending that money every time you're putting it in there, you that's a waste. Another thing, that's a waste. But I, to me, that's how you build, I mean, a great herd. You got to experiment. You got to put them through some stress sometimes just to see. You know, just like what you seen, that was an experiment. We wanted to see with no creep feed, you know, just on that side, what that side could take up to eight weeks, you know, and we got a chance to see that they could wean a great pig off in of eight weeks with no extra feed, you know, with no creep feeding. And um, so we're going to creep feed this next set, but it's good to know if we get in the tight or if we need to do that, that we can push it or that we can slow down on how much we have been creek feeding in the past and still come out with a quality pig so we still want the quality um we try to figure out how to save that bottom line but without sacrificing quality that's the main thing gotcha one point that i think you made which was an excellent point is trying like actually doing some research but then experimenting yeah and then one thing i tell people is when you're farming, you're not just a farmer. You're a business analyst. You're a researcher. Scientist. Um, scientist. <laughs> you know, sometimes mad scientists. Yeah, I mean, mad scientists. You're doing some crazy stuff. Me. <laughs> um, but I think the cool thing about it, though, is, uh, and there's always a limit, right? Of yeah. Like, yeah. I'm doing something, and I'm seeing it's not working. working. That's right. We're going to either cut it or change something up. Yeah. And that's what a lot of folks don't do that I've noticed new beginning farmers, homesteaders, they will read some out of a book. Yeah. Oh, they saw a video on YouTube from some celebrity homesteader <laughs> or whatever. 
and um, it's a lot of missing information. Yeah. And then they'll try to partake that missing information as fact. Yeah. And then oftentimes we see, or at least I see, emaciated pigs. Um, I've seen sows that uh, had stillborns, yeah. not because the sow couldn't be productive, but because people were just not feeding adequate feed towards that sow. Yeah. Uh, and so I think a good recommendation is until you really experience with pigs, first couple of years, store bought, not that bad of an idea until, you know, you build up that rapport and that knowledge base after two years, three years, then start mixing up things, do things a little differently. And I think even when you're starting to buy grain, um, new and beginning farming, starting to buy grain, you start to appreciate your business a lot more versus just, well, oh, I just start feeding slop. You day one got awful pigs and wasn't really sure how much time, energy, and money you were putting into it. Yeah. And so I think that's also important as well. So, you know, thinking about how your operations not only grown, but you've made better business decisions, uh, what's kind of the future for uh, Roy Mosley Farms? Like, what are you thinking about doing to expand your operation or to grow it out? Um, and this is from like a, a like a businessman perspective. What what are you doing to expand? Well, um, I got pretty good at my marketing side, so <laughs> now we've we've kind of over marketed till we have to expand um, to try to keep up with our customers. So, if Lord blesses me to keep having great customers like I have, um, I want to keep pushing to eventually get to. We want to run about 40 sows at this farm. And then at another farm, we want to run about the same amount. So I'm not going to say where I'm going to stop, but um, <laughs> I'm hoping one day to be close to 100 sows um, doing feeder pigs, still doing big groups of feeder pigs. Um, the fair, and that, that's, that's my passion. I love, you know, taking care of the sows, getting them to that point of fair and seeing those babies get going, you know, and getting that pig up to where it can go on a trailer on its own and be a, you know, turn out a great quality grower for whoever takes it to that next level. Um, I just get a lot of sense of pride in that. So um, we're definitely going to push that. Unless the Lord shows me different, we're going to stay about where we're at on the row crop and we're not going to go too much big on the row crop right now. That's just, ooh, <laughs> that's you a, done bought a whole subject. bunch of equipment. That, <laughs> yeah, that's another subject. Shh. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah um somebody told me i better not buy any more equipment this year so uh somebody who uh, said somebody <laughs> my soon-to-be wife right here <laughs> um but um yeah just and try to expand our vegetable operation once again networking with other farmers um me and my buddy marvin have been working on some things on the vegetable side so we're hoping to have our own little network where we can move both of our vegetables, everything that we have throughout the year through our own little pipeline and not have to try to deal with so many other people. So just trying to hone that and, and get that down pat and get this other farm set up for more pigs and bring in the more sows. So Woo. more sows, more sows. Hey man, more sows, <laughs> more money, more money. That's right, more money. Not necessarily more problems, but you know. and um, we we've uh did our experiment with the farm tours this past year, and and each one we did was a hit. Um, I want my farm to be more of a teaching hub, so we're going to try to do a lot of tours with the kids this year and bringing them out and teaching them how to plant gardens and animal husbandry classes. Um, then later on this year, we actually want to try to do. Um, we were talking about doing, I don't know whether to call it like a homestead, uh, homesteading class. It's really not what it's going to be, but we want to actually do some for the adults, for people that actually want to come out and learn a different style of pig farming and to see how I do things, you know, and I call it pig ranching is, <laughs> is my term for it. So to try to do some classes on that and get people out to the farm, you know, and teach them that there's some alternative ways to, to grow pigs. I know if your farm tour, uh, we had because I went to one of them where the there was a oh the beer van came out yeah Atlanta beer van Atlanta beer Atlanta beer boutique and uh all of the um a lot of the breweries from Atlanta all came down and we did a tour for them here at the farm and it was a big hit 
We were actually supposed to do one this fall, but we canceled it because of COVID. We were supposed to do a big bonfire and all of that stuff and a beer and bacon event, we were calling it. But um, we can't, had to cancel it because of COVID. So we're hoping this summer, after everything settled back out, we can try to crank those back up also. And then you had a, a couple of homeschooling groups as well. Like what, what were some of those that um, came to your farm? Yeah, well, same thing we were talking about with the kids. They brought the kids out. We did um, hay rides, uh, let the kids get a chance to pe feed the pigs and learn about the different uh, cycles of uh, a farrow to finish operation. They actually got a chance to feed them, and then we also took them over to the garden. So those kids got a chance to learn how to plant onions and different kinds of greens. And we actually kept up with the uh, stuff while it was growing and took pictures and sent them to the kids at the homeschool. And then when they came back, they actually got a chance to take some of that back with them. And it, I mean, it just gave them a great sense of pride. Um, we did pork piggy burgers for them and that kind of stuff and fed them. So it was, it was a good time. They had a great time. A lot of kids didn't want to leave when it was time to go. I don't blame them. And then they got to come back and yeah, and get the stuff that they planted. And so that was pretty neat. Well, I want to ask you uh, also about the your land management practices. Uh, you talk a lot about how um, you're not only you know ha having pasture, but also improving your pasture. But then you also talk about, and I think this is unique for me to have a friend like you who not only does um, pigs out in the field, out on pasture, but you also do a lot of um planting row cropping yeah and some of that is for your pigs yes uh, so talk about how that's been advantageous or beneficial for you and your farm in terms of reducing feed costs providing um uh, better macro and micronutrients for your hogs yeah um same thing like with the baelish this year we'll actually have um we're going to actually try to do something to sell to some other farmers um some of my pig buyers in south carolina actually want to get some to try for their sows, this go around. So we're going to do about 10, 11 acres in Baelish this year. Um, and off those 10, 11 acres, we can get somewhere around 200 bales off of two cuttings. Woo! So um, hoping to be able to put up enough for myself and sell part of it. Um, we're going to try to peas again this year, try to get some of those rolled up. Um, grain sorghum uh, is a cheaper crop to grow than corn and has a lot of the same uh, feeding nutritional value. So we're going to go back to grain sorghum this year instead of corn. We did corn the last two years for our pigs. But um, prices are, I mean, input prices are going through the roof. It's going to be very hard with nitrogen double the price this year to, you know, for it to be even economical for me to be growing corn to feed these pigs. Um, it's so much stuff that I can get for way cheaper, you know, than it would take me to grow it. The vegetable part of the operation is great. That's another source of green feed for the pigs. It's it's great just having the tractors and equipment so I'm able to better manage my pastures at the hog farm. Being able to oversee my pastures with small grains and things like that. So we don't do one type of grass um, during the summer or the winter. We do, I believe, in mixes, you know, several different things. And even in the middle of the summer, we might come in and clip pastures if they start getting rough and oversee them with something else, you know, more nutritious or succulent you know for them to graze on that summer and just hard management on the grass we don't necessarily uh, people ask me all the time about stocking rates and stuff like that but the biggest questions i get how many pounds per day i feed my sows and what are my stocking rates how many pigs on pasture these ain't cows y'all <laughs> these are not cows and i tell people um i don't believe in stocking rates on pigs i mean you can go by what they tell you in the book um some people believe in that five, six sows to the acre, but I tell farmers, if you're going to have pasture, if you're not going to have a complete dirt pen out there, that you have to manage the grass, not the pigs. So our paddocks range from three acre paddocks to two acres to a half an acre paddock in some spots. Um, and just the other day, uh, Ryan had some pictures of it. We had about, I don't even know how many, maybe 60 pigs in all uh 60 pigs and all on a half acre and it lasted them over a week just about right at seven days so i mean just manage the grass um when it gets down to a certain length we move them and just the constant rotation and if you don't have enough room break your paddocks down smaller don't don't pigs are can do like cows they'll get sweet spots on the pasture that they love and they'll overgraze them and then the rest of your pasture will grow up with weeds 
and then that's when a lot of rooting and stuff starts. Um, that causes rooting and letting your grass get too short, letting them graze it back too short uh, can cause a lot of rooting also. Amen, amen. All right, we're going to uh, stop with the farming questions and uh, start with uh, some uh, heart questions. Uh, so you are about to get married, and thank you for inviting me to the wedding. I'm super excited to be uh, coming uh, this spring. Um, but let, let's talk about how, you know, in farming, you're, you're spending a lot of hours farming on top of having a job as well. Um, you know, and you also have a family. And t talk about how, what have been some struggles in being able to love your family well, uh, but also have responsibilities on the farm? For a farmer, depending on your operation, it could be a balance in that. And, um... Oh no! Use use. I want you to use I statements. Yeah, yeah, I am, yeah. I am. But I'm just, I'm just putting that out there. Period. You know, um, but it could be a balance, and like you, you, you just have to kind of find the balance. Um, it's even times I have to catch myself now, and you know, thank God I do have a good woman that's understanding. You know, a lot of women wouldn't understand the long hours and stuff that you have to put in on the farm. Um, and at certain times when you have to put in more hours than average on the farm you know and you got to be gone and leaving before daybreak and coming in after dark um but just finding that balance i mean just taking the time to slow down and just disappear and you know me and her just slow down sometimes and you know we're gonna take a trip and go here you know and just spend some time or you know every blue moon she can hold me in the house on a sunday and i'll just we'll just hang around the house and just you know enjoy each other not even really get out and do anything just enjoy each other um and when you're gone all the time, I mean, that's a lot, you know. So just, just finding that balance, it, it can be hard because I've been, it's been times in my farm career where I have been so focused on what I'm doing and so focused on being great that, you know, you can sacrifice everything. You can sacrifice your family, your friends, um, everything and in pursuit of what you're doing and just making sure you don't lose sight of what's important because, you know, I mean, it, it it would kill you to gain the world and then lose everything else, you know, to feel like you've conquered everything you wanted to do. And lose, lose your everything. soul, man. Yeah. Yeah. So. Do you feel like uh, you've grown more in maturity since the um, you having to leave your initial farm and go to this operation and property? Do you feel like that's also helped with that? Yeah. Just really letting you see what and who is important in your life, you know, the people that were really there for you and, you know, the people that were just along for the ride, you know, when you were doing great and, you know, you had everything going and then to go all the way back to nothing and having to start over, it, it just really shows you people's true colors and it just was a wake up call for me to, to realize what was important or who was important in my life and who wasn't. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, so uh, his fiance is uh, sitting right out there and um, hi, hi to show. How are you doing? <laughs> and uh, I want to ask her um, uh, a question. Is it OK if I have you on camera? You look great. You look great. Well, how about this? Can I pass the microphone to you uh, and then you can talk? Is that OK? Can we do that? OK, cool. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Um, so I'm going to put him in the hot seat for a minute. Uh, sorry, the love seat. My apologies. The love seat for a minute. Uh, you don't come necessarily from a farming background, and uh, now you're about to be married to a farmer. And uh, I'm just curious, with all that he has gone through, uh, what, what's been... Uh, one or a couple of the things that you've seen change about him that um, makes you more confident in him being a better husband to you uh, for the future. He's dedicated. Everything that he loves and that he wants to do, he does it. And it, it inspires me to keep going towards my goals. You know, he's just a good person and it's just, good to see him grow and get bigger you know because he got too comfortable and now he getting bigger 
you know, God is opening doors for him. And it's just a blessing to see him just uh, elevating. And uh, I'm just proud of him. And I tell him to keep going. Keep your head up. You're going to be perfect. You're going to be do everything you want to do. Sometimes he work himself. His bones be twitching. <laughs> you had me farming all night. <laughs> but, you know, it's okay. He say study his craft. And I... I I'm I'm good with that. So everybody says, how you marry a farmer? Did you meet him for (laughs) farmers.com? Or they thought he was the old white man. (laughs) (laughs) I said, no, Roy is actually younger than me. And, you know, this is what he's been born to. And you got to respect that. And I love it so much because he loves it. I get up there and ride on the tractor with him. (laughs) <laughs> I know he got to be out here. So if I got to, I'll pull a little weeds and pick a little peas if that's what he want me to do. Anything to support him. Man, that's a lot of love. I appreciate your response. You can uh, hand it back to him now. All right. So, Roy, I want to give you uh, just a minute to respond to uh, the affirmation of your soon to be wife. How does that make you feel? to hear those words uh, about yourself from her. I mean, it makes me feel great. I mean, that's what it's all about. I mean, I, you know, I could care less what somebody in the streets or something, you know, have to say or how they feel about me. But, you know, hearing that from her, that that's what it's all about. That's, she's one of the ones that I do it for, so. Y'all look at him grinning. <laughs> ain't he adorable look at him <laughs> all right last question i think this is really pertinent um you know clearly you're uh you're definitely not white you're uh <laughs> you're, you're you're very black yeah. oh. <laughs> uh, we are the chocolate variety <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, and so um you know you have a, a long history of uh, from your family of farming and being a part of the land yeah. and land ownership. Uh, I, I want you just like talk about what your experience has been like being a black farmer, especially in a small town and uh, what words of encouragement you might want to give to any other uh, I, I don't want to say minority, but I'd rather say majority uh, culture because most of the globe is not pale or anything like that. We brown or tan <laughs> of some kind, you know. But uh, what what words of advice would you have as well? So first your experience and then uh, words of advice. Um, my experience in farming as a black farmer is one way to put it. It's been a heck of a ride. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I've been met with some adversity. Um, I've had to deal with, you know, having to deal with not being able to do certain stuff or get stuff because of my race or people not wanting to help me even because of my race or after they found out I was black. A lot of people talk to me on the phone and then they, (laughs) I've had that happen with (laughs) a couple of times and then they see me and it's like, oh. (laughs) <laughs> Whoa. So, oh, are you a farm here? I'm, I'm here for the farm owner. Okay? Yeah, I've had somebody do that and ask me. Uh, I had a guy um, while I was taking pigs a long time ago. This was when we was at the other farm, and um, he just swore that uh, either I worked for somebody else or I had stole those p- pretty pigs that I had to. Um, and um, we almost got into it, and then the owner came out of the back and. Uh, recognize who I was because my granddad used to sell hot pigs there, and um, kind of diffuse the situation. But um, that was one of them days I had about had enough. But um, just to tell any other anybody else to just, I mean, no matter what, no matter what you come against, you are gonna get knocked down sometimes, and it ain't always gonna go your way. Just get back up, keep fighting. I mean, that's the main thing. I mean, I've been through. Not saying I've been through the worst stuff in the world because I know there's plenty of people who've been through way worse, but I've been through almost everything imaginable with um, trying to pursue my farming career. And that's the only thing I can tell them. Just don't give up. Just keep going. I mean, keep getting up fighting. And everything you're going through and fighting is going to help make you a better farmer in the end. Um, I feel like 
that's why I'm at the level that I'm at now is because of all the experiences and the good and bad that I had to deal with and go through and fight through. And I feel like that's what shaped me to be a better farmer. Don't be afraid to start with nothing. I mean, Amen. Um, I push my feed and, and bread in the woods with a wheelbarrow um, when I started back. Not lying. Um, five and six loads. I mean, back and forth, pigs about to knock me over trying to feed up, and I did that for a long time. I mean, so just don't be afraid to start with what you got. Quit giving it. Don't give yourself excuses because you can stand there and give yourself a hundred excuses um, why not to start. Um and it don't take nothing but you just to jump out there and start, and things will start falling in place. Even if you lost, you don't have all the information, all of that, just start. Um, people are more likely to help you if they see you trying. Um, not just talking about what you're going to do, but if people see you actually out here trying and trying to have something. Um, this past year, um, a lot of the, some of the big farmers came together and helped me, not even just as far as knowledge, my first year growing peanuts this year, um, but people just seeing me out here being relentless. I mean, that's one of my things that's going to be on some of my shirts, remain relentless. That's what I always tell people. Uh, those guys came through and, you know, gave me a wealth of knowledge this year. Um, one of the farmers, he, I don't know why he took to me, but he just pulled me to the side one day and was like, you know, if there's anything I can do to help you, I'll help you. He was like, I just, I see what you're doing, you know, and if I can help you, I will. And um, he was just a wealth of knowledge telling me when to do stuff and, you know, just giving me free game on that. And that's something I wish farmers would do more. Um, we have a tendency sometimes when we find something that work or something that worked for us, we want to bottle it all up, you know, a lot of times. And um, I think it's great for us to start sh sharing information um, amongst each other. And it would make it a whole lot better for the next generation that's trying to come in if we would share that information but um i even had old timers tell me that and they the philosophy is they had to work hard and figure it out they feel like you should have to work hard and figure it out amen but my philosophy is if i can help you not make some of these mistakes and and get to that point of being greater faster i would rather see you get there greater faster i see in in, the, in our circle in the pork industry a lot of times we view each other as competition but um i feel like if I'm being the greatest that I can be at what I'm doing. I have no competition. Um, I don't care if you move right down the road and you have 100 sales. Um, the quality that I produce and what I do, I still feel like I have no competition. And um, every farmer needs to get to that point. And then you're not afraid to share your information with your brother because you're not viewing him as your competition. I love it. I love it. Well, brother, I appreciate the conversation. Um, so we're going to wrap this up. <laughs> and um tell folks uh, how they can reach out if they want maybe to partner up with you and buy some of your pork products or uh to buy feeder pigs or maybe even breeding stock. How can they get a hold of you? Um, you can find me on Instagram at Mosley uh underscore farms underscore pasture underscore pork. Um you can find me on Facebook at uh Roy Mosley Jr. Uh my farm store is open pretty much every Saturday. Give me a holler. Um, we, we're at 412 uh, Troy Polk Road in Portal, Georgia. If you want to set up for a farm tour or try to sign up for one of our classes this summer, um, just reach out to me. Um, I'll be glad to talk pigs with anybody. He ain't lying about that either. <laughs> That's 100% if, fat. No cap. If, if you need um, breeding stock, um, we're going to have some great breeding stock available this summer. That, that's going to be going to some different farms in some different states. I'm excited about that. Um, we started doing breeding stock last year. And we're also looking for maybe a couple growers uh, to get some breeding stock to, you know, get in a herd of four or five. And we're going to do a guarantee where we buy the feeder pigs back from you. So. Ooh, all right. I love the sound of that. Um, well, uh, another thing I think it's really important, I feel like my following, uh, for most part, is a loving community. And so one way I think uh, of showing love and support is through prayer. Uh, so how can we be praying for you, dude? Pray for my strength, uh, my family, and wisdom. Um, I'm, I'm all the time learning. Uh, I don't want to ever stop learning. So I just pray that God continue to give me the wisdom for me to be a great leader, you know, um, 
and to continue to be able to show me the ways that he that he wants me to uh, go about helping, not just my people, but just young people, period, you know, the ag community, period. A lot of people are pulling away from the ag community. I want more um, young black kids to get back into farming. Um, it's going to start with the parents. Um, we have a stigmatism toward farming. Um, we had a lot of bad experience in farming. And a lot of us, so when we got a chance, we got away from the farm and we have a stigmatism toward it. And just don't be afraid to reintroduce your kids to it. Um, we're great lovers of the land. We just got to get out here and get reintroduced to it again. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all on that. I, I want to say that. That's a lot of, that's a lot to be praying about, <laughs> but uh, I might as well add world peace to that. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, you mind for pray for you? No, go ahead, man. Cool. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for uh, just a brother in my life, God. Uh, Roy has been uh, not just a good friend, but he's been uh, one of many best friends in my life, Lord, who uh, was there for me in my time of need when I was down in the dumps. He was giving me a call and encouraging me, Lord. And so I appreciate his brotherhood. I appreciate uh, the love and the tenacity that you've given him, Lord, not just simply for the land, but also for his family and for his friends, his brothers, his sisters, Lord, um, and for you. I just pray, Lord, that he would have leadership in his life, God, and I pray that he would be reminded daily, moment by moment, Lord, uh, that true, genuine leadership, um, as he sees, Lord, is found through you, God. So I pray that you give him the wisdom that he needs. I pray that he'd also seek that wisdom, Lord, knowing that uh, you've already given it to him, God, uh, that's sitting on, on the table, and all he needs to do is pick it up and grab it, Lord. Uh, let him walk in obedience, and in that obedience, let him be confident in the word that you have for him and his family and his farm and his relationships, Lord. I pray all this, oh, also, uh, Lord, I do pray for all the folks uh, that feel disheartened, even disenfranchised, Lord, from being a part of the land, God, uh, whatever they might look like, Lord. I pray that um, they would have a renewed spirit. I pray that there would be a generation of uh, brown, black, uh, even white farmers, Lord, who have a renewed spirit about the land and can see it as a part of your creation and treat it as a part of your creation rather than as something that is uh, to be tainted, something that is to be abused, Lord. I pray that uh, farmers who are currently farming, Lord, uh, would also treat the land with respect, Lord, uh, not simply for the sake of regenerative farming or agriculture, but also for the simple sake of honoring you and your creation and all the good things that you provided for them in their life, Lord. I pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, brother, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you having me. And uh, yeah, man, uh, that's it, folks. Uh, if you are excited and you you want to, man, we need to get a port from Roy Mosley, and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to speak that on them. We need to get we need a pin from Roy Mosley. Um, definitely comment below. Uh, also, send my DM. Let them know that Pork Ryan sent you. And that you'll be thinking about them, praying for them, or just encouraging them and want to be able to participate with them. Uh, but other than that, I'll pass. And I hope you all have a solid, blessed day. Peace. Uh -huh.